Hello there. Hopefully you can all hear me outside and online. My name is Will Seibritz. I'm a scientific sales representative here for Nanian Technologies. I just actually finished my PhD in cardio cardiac electrophysiology. And so I'm very happy to chair this session today on new advances in cardiovascular research and stem cells as well. So to start things off with a bang, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, David Beach. David is a professor in Leeds, UK. He completed his PhD in London and then did various postdoctoral work over in the US in Seattle, the University of Washington. He then came back to London, UK, and then eventually established his group in Leeds as well. He has a keen focus on um, calcium homeostasis. He's also got a keen interest in calcium entry other than the typical voltage-gated calcium ion channels. So uh, we've already heard today from Niels that we're going to be hearing some exciting work on Piezo one and that's what David's here to talk to us about today. So David, thank you very much for being here, and without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation. Um, I was fortunate enough to come and visit Nanai when it was in the university many, many years ago when Niels and Andrea and Michael were, were starting out, and it's an absolute pleasure to see the success of the company and all the new, not just gadgets, you know, fancy, incredible technology that's, I think, really transforming the ion channel field and very promising uh, for Piezo, as you'll, you'll see hopefully in a moment. Um, for those who are not familiar with Piezo, I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of background and um, but then try to focus on um, a little bit of sort of pharmacology, 96 volt plate system, and then coming, of course, into the nanion work that's been done recently on Piezo, and I think shows great promise. Um, I think many of you may know that the two Piezo proteins were discovered by Bertrand's Cost and Ardham Pataputian published in 2010, in December of that, that, that year. And um, Arden Pataputin went on to get the Nobel Prize for this work and some other work that he did on uh, um, temperature sensation. And uh, the piezo channels are remarkable ion channels. Many um, ion channels, I think, are mechanically sensitive, but these are what I call exquisite mechanosensors. So they're, they're a very special biological design. Um, this um, picture um, here, I can just get myself sorted. Um, it's actually a molecular dynamic simulation of two types of ion channel in a lipid bilayer, actually an endothelial cell bilayer, because I'm interested in um, vascular biology. And these these green ones are polycystin two ion channels. Now, a lot of ion channels look like that. Uh, these are also thought to be involved in mechano sensation. Um, but this is the piezo piezo channel. These, these are actually tetramers, and this is a trimer, and it really has these beautiful sort of blade-like structures here. It's said to be a triskelion or for a pro propeller blade-like structure and that sort of goes out into the membrane and feels the tension in the membrane and actually can feel a variety of forces. So lot, like lots of proteins, it is mechanically sensitive, but it seems like the piezo has evolved for that purpose to provide mechanosensing and then transduction of that mechanical force into effect through iron um, flux through the iron pore, which is just underneath this cap-like structure here. In the end, um, closed um, state, it uh, unusually dimples the membrane inward by about six to seven nanometers. And um, I'll show you later on when there's force applied, then this, this flattened and the ion channel moves up, but I'll show you a bit more about that. I'm um, going to move forward here. I'm going to do it with this. Which button do I need to press? I'll wait for this. Is it this one down here? Just there. Oh, then I'm doing better here. <laughs> so it's um, now almost 10 years since we published our first major paper on piezos. We were fortunate enough to get it into nature. And I think um, particularly important finding in this paper was that piezo is a fluid flow sensor. I'll come back to that later on. Um, the um, knockout is, is lethal. This um, is a global knockout result here. But we also did an endothelial specific knockout and got a similar result. So uh, this is embryo um, day nine to 10, so about halfway through for the um, for the mouse. And hopefully you can see that the embryo is smaller than you see in the wild type, so it's growth retarded. And you don't see many embryos past about day nine, 10, 11. They then sort of um, reabsorb. And so um, it's, a, it's a lethal phenotype. We found that at the same time, the um, yolk sac um, vasculature was disrupted. This is an endothelial stain. So you don't get any don't get any maturing vessels and that was interesting to us because we knew that the vessels mature in the embryo yolk sac because the heart starts to beat at about day eight and a half. 
pushes blood into this nascent vasculature and that flow, fluid flow is sensed by something. And then that causes the vessels to remodel and to become larger and allow, allow blood to flow into the developing organs of the embryo. And so if that doesn't happen, as in the knockout, then the organs don't develop and the embryo just um, retracts. We could show that the um, fluid flow sensing of these endothelial cells, these are from the embryo, um, the, these cells normally align in the direction of laminar flow, but that's disrupted by the knockout. Um, we could show by calcium measurement, because this is a calcium permeable ion channel, and um, that there's a signal here, a calcium signal that occurs in response to fluid flow. So it's quite small, the knockout is missing, and then it's followed by an amplification. Sam Fountain was mentioning earlier on about things like ATP being released, B2X, receptor activation, all kinds of things, including intracellular calcium release that happen afterwards. But we think that um, one of the earliest events with shear stress sensing is the activation of the piezo channel. We were encouraged in that when we um, took hex cells and did calcium um, measurement. If we didn't transfect to the hex cells, then they don't respond to the uh, shear stress shown here in dimes per centimeter squared. But if we transfected in wild type human piezo one, then we could get quite nice shear stress um, responses. So that was the first time that a fluid flow response had been reconstituted with a single protein. The um, knockout is, is lethal. So to study the adult animal, and which we wanted to do because fluid flow sensing by the endothelium is very important in adult health. It's important in how exercise protects you um, against cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's very important in atherosclerosis, um, which is the condition that causes most of the deaths world worldwide, particularly from heart attacks and strokes, a lot of dis disability. So we're very interested in that fluid flow sensing process. But to look in the adult, adult animal, we need to do a conditional deletion. So we let the animals grow to adult adulthood first of all, and then we delete endothelial piezo one, um, and then we see what happens. We um, take the mesenteric vessels, so they're ones that are important in controlling blood, vessel, um, blood pressure, um, pull off outside out patches, put them into a fluid flow and see what happens. There's spontaneous activity of the channels. It looks sort of messy here, but if we expand out the time base, we can see the unitary current events which are 25 picosiemens, which is the right conductance for the piezo one channel. We apply fluid flow and the activity gets greater. We have multiple openings and multiple channels, and then it's blocked by gadolinium, one of the blockers of the piezo channel, by no means specific. Uh, these channels are completely missing in the piezo endothelial specific knockout. So these are piezo one channels activated by fluid flow. I mentioned on the first slide that in the closed state, the channel um, dimples the membrane or forms a dome-like structure. Uh, this is known not from our work, but from various cryo-EM structural data that have been produced by groups in um, China and the, uh, and the two groups in the States, starting with uh, Rob McKinnon, but also Arden Pataputin and Beilong Xiao. Um, so what we've done then is a molecular dynamic simulation based on those cryo-EM data. And really beautifully in the um, um, molecular dynamic simulation, which is in, in an endothelial lipid bilayer, um, then the channel forms this dimple-like structure. So it starts off flat when we put it in into the simulation, and then with time it forms a dimple. And this is thought to be the closed um, structure and the little cap up here. So three piezos come together. It's a trimer. Each one's pretty large. The total thing is about 900 kilodaltons. And um, there are 114 membrane-spanning domains in total, so quite a big, quite a big protein. A lot of the protein is in these outer uh, areas here, so-called blade-like structures. And then in the last two membrane-spanning domains of the iron pore region, and there's a cap-like structure, which I think probably is a little bit like a bottle cap. When um, you apply tension to the bile bilayer um, in the simulation, then the channel flattens, and that has been observed by Beilong Xiao in inverted lipid bilayers by cryo-electron microscopy as well, and also by atomic force microscopy. And then the cap lifts up and then the iron pore opens. And the details of this are still being worked out, but we can see some opening of a pore-like region in the molecular dynamic simulation. So we're trying to understand how this works at the moment. Um, but the bottom line is that it's a, um, a really beautiful mechano sensor directly sensing mechanical force, responding in milliseconds to mechanical force, and that seems to be the only stimulus. So you now 14 years of intense research effort. There have been a few suggestions of other things, 
Um, but I think the current conclusion is only mechanical force will activate. We'll see. Right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some newer stuff now, but this is um, a paper not published by us, but published by um, Pia Ostergaard, who works at St. George's Hospital in London. So she's a um, geneticist working on the condition of um, generalized lymphatic dysplasia. There are now known to be at least 16 different genes involved in causing this primary lymphedema. And one of those genes, when it's in variant form, um, is piezo-1. So she, she reported um, several variants of piezo-1 that are associated with this rare condition Caused, um, called generalized lymphatic dysplasia. And um, this is, of course, of interest to us because it shows disease uh, and human relevance to piezo-1. Um, but this also is showing an endothelial phenotype because not everybody um, knows, but the lymphatic system is part of the cardiovascular system. And uh, the lymphatics are endothelial tubes and they have some muscle cells around the outside and they have valves inside them like veins and things. So this is part of the cardiovascular system is very important in cardiovascular health. So this suggests um, an endothelial phenotype with a particular effect um, on the endothelial cells of the lymphatics. There are not many of these people, so there are other features of these people that have yet to be investigated and their condition is quite serious. So there may be other cardiovascular problems in these people. So we've been working with Pierre Ostergaard to study this, this further. And um, these mutations she described disrupted the expression of the protein. So there actually are people who are piezo-1 null, so the knockouts, even though the mouse um, knockout is lethal, seems that some people survive, and it, it may be that knockout is off, often embryonic lethal in people as well. It might be a cause of miscarriage, I'm speculating. It may be that not many people escape. Just a few people are lucky enough, let's say, um, but they, they live, but then they're not well. Um, so it's luck and bad luck. So we've been looking more with Pierre Ostergaard, um, at so-called GLD families, generalized lymphatic dysplasia um, families. So what's um, quite common in these families is that parents have a single mutation, and the parents seem to be relatively normal, no identified disease. Um, but then when those two mutations come together, in this case, you can see these two here, and then the child, the probands, um, has generalized lymphatic dysplasia and is really very ill. Uh, the number of features of these patients, and as I say, this is just starting to emerge. We, um, Pierre Ostergaard now has 35 families who, are, who have GLD sufferers within them, and we're starting to understand what are the features of the disease. One thing that's quite interesting is pericardial effusion. So there's, there's um, fluid around the heart, which is actually a common problem clinically, as well as in people who've got lymphatic dysplasia, and also vascular abnorm abnormalities that are evident in the eye. So it may be beyond the lymphatics, there may be other... Um, cardiovascular problems in these people that have yet to be uh, revealed. So we're starting to study these um, mutations. Uh, one thing that really struck us was, and I'll just show you a little bit of data here for um, two of the mutations in the human piezo-1. I'll just focus your attention first of all on this one, at Presbyterian 2270 here. Um, and this is the expression level of the piezo-1. In this case, we've overexpressed it in hex cells. And we've got an HA tag on it, so we're absolutely certain we're looking at the overexpressed protein. So this is overexpressed piezo-1. So there's good expression of the protein here compared to the wild type. This one's a bit less, and then these are three repeats here. But this shows us that this um, patient um, who's got a, a mutation, one of the families has only this um, mutation here, but two copies of it, so then the homozygote um, point mutation, and that the expression of the protein is normal. You can still get expression of the protein. So that made us think that there may be changes in function. And um, we've studied this in human channel and mouse channel, and I'm actually going to show you the mouse data. And here we'll come on to some technical things about um, piezos later, but the, piezo the mouse piezo one channel um, is more robust to study, and it's the one that's studied by far the most in the literature. Um, but I'll show you here, this is a pressure curve produced by patch clamp recording, outside out patch recording, where we're applying positive pressure, so we're pushing the outside out patch outward a little bit to activate the channels. Not, not actually showing you the currents here, but we can come back to that later on. So we increase the amount of pressure here, then you get a pressure response curve here, and then you can calculate the midpoint of the curve here for the channel, so therefore the pressure sensitivity and the slope of this curve. And then we do that for mutations, and in this case they're um, recapitulated in the mouse channel. 
And showing here that um, this is the wild type curve without dotted line is just from here. Um, but with the mutation here, there's no mechanical activation. And this one, no mechanical activation. These two are shifted to the right. So that suggests these mutations um, can inhibit mechanical sensitivity. So what we're interested in is the possibility, uh, obviously, to, to help these patients and therefore rescue channel activity. So in a situation, obviously, if you've got a patient where they're knockout and there's no piezo protein, not, there's not much point in having a piezo agonist, probably. Um, but in these patients where they've lost the mechanical sensitivity but the channel is still there, it may be possible to activate the channels. So um, this paper here is very interesting. This is uh, not from our group, but it's from Martin Pataputin's group, but it's actually the basis of a screen by Novartis of 3.25 million compounds against hex cells overexpressing piezo-1 and piezo-2. And then they reported this molecule here. And if you get into piezo, you need to get into Star Wars films because there are now lots of these different kinds of molecules. Uh, we found produce one called Dooku-1 because Count Dooku is the opponent of Yoda. And this Yoda thing, for those who don't know, means it comes from May the Force be with you. So this is sort of part of one of the catchphrases of the, of the film. And also some Jedi compounds, these Obi-Wan compounds. You can probably think of a lot more. Over dinner, that'll be a topic. Oh, yeah, so yeah, people are naming these things. So um, so this thing, Yoda 1, there have been some criticisms of this uh, compound in the literature that um, maybe it's not that specific. And of course, we always think that with pharmacology, but actually it's a very useful agent. And so this right-hand part of the molecule is particularly important. You have these two um, chlorine atoms here on this phenol ring here, then a methyl, and then a sulfonyl, and then here a thiol group here with these two um, diazole, a, azole, diazole, this diazole group here, then going into the pyrazine ring here. And um, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. Anyway, I told you that we've got these um, mutants where they're mechanically insensitive. So what we've been doing is calcium measurement. And uh, first of all, we just... Um, and put the empty vector, we transfect the empty vector into our hex cells and apply Yoda, which is the agonist of the piezo one, as I just told you. And um, th there are some small signals, but not very much. If we put in a wild type channel, and then you get a nice dose response uh, here for, for Yoda one. And very nicely, we were pleased to see with the mutants here, you can get dose response curves to Yoda one. So you can now get channel activity. So that makes us think it might be possible. Um, to at least partially rescue the channel activity. And we think you probably only need 50% of your normal channel activity to be reasonably healthy because we think that's what's happening with the parents. And uh, they have a single mutation, but they're kind of okay. Um, we can also show, um, so I pointed out before, that these are not normally mechanically activated. These mutations are not mechanically activated. This is a pressure step. But if we do this in the presence of Yoda 1, then we can then get mechanical activation. <laughs> not quite normal, but it's encouraging that it might be possible. Um, but there are some challenges with Yoda, Yoda 1. Um, first of all, these are the dose response curves here for the wild type. And then all of these mutants here, this is the amount of Yoda 1 increasing here. So the Yoda curves for the mutants are to the right of the Yoda 1. And so you need to go to quite high concentrations. And that's a problem because here are some of the pharmacal, um, sorry, some of the physical chemical properties of the Yoda 1, uh, which are problematic. So the solubility is not very good to. Um, maybe even less than one micromolar, and then the compound's starting to come out of solution. Of course, you can include DMSO in the solution. You see that we sometimes use 10 micromolar. Yeah? You see sometimes people use 20 micromolar in the literature. Yeah, but the problem is that the compound's starting to come out of solution. Um, also, uh, the stability of the compound is not great, and a lot of it is protein-bound, so this is the amount that's free. So those familiar with drug discovery, probably people here are much better at this than I am, but I just we uh, can recognize these things are important. So we've been starting to do um, experiments um, with Richard Foster, a medicinal chemist, um, that leads to produce Yoda-1 analogs on the basis that perhaps there's a Yoda-1 binding site on the channel. That is not proved, um, but it seems to be likely that is the case. And so we're making various um, analogs of Yoda-1. As I mentioned before, there's um, this um, double chlorine phenyl ring here. Um, we have reported earlier, back in 2018, actually, that this side of the molecule is pretty critical. I will, I will show you an example later on where there are methyl groups here. Um, but you do need to retain that structure on the right, as far as we know. Um, we've been focusing on the left-hand side of the molecule. This is the pyrazine moiety here. And then making some benzoic acid derivatives. So sometimes 
hydroxyl group is on on the um, on two position here, then third, fourth, and to give you the answer, then having it on this position is quite good. So then we um, test the molecules in calcium measurement assays. This is a flex station, a 96 volt calcium measurement. Many of you will be familiar with that using Pura 2 to measure calcium. And then we're adding the compounds. It's a chemical assay, and we've got cells overexpressing uh, the human piezo one. So the Yoda gives a signal like this, calcium going up. The KC157, this is Kevin Cuthbertson, the PhD student who made the compound. Uh, this one here uh, doesn't give anything, uh, but the 159, so this one here gives quite a nice signal. Uh, this 289 is actually the same as 159, except it's the potassium salt. So by doing this kind of thing, you can find um, compounds that are still active. And of course, what we want is ones with better properties. So we were pleased to find that the solubility of these compounds is better than that of, of Yoda-1. Um, also improved stability, some characteristics here um, also better. So it shows that it's possible to retain agonism and improve the physical chemical properties. These are some dose response curves um, for the for the compounds. This is this is Yoda-1 here, in this case against mouse piezo-1. We've done it against both. You can find quite a lot of details in here. And um, these are the outer limits, the boundaries of the data. So what we find with Yoda-1 is that the response is quite variable. So sometimes you get really a beautiful dose response curve, another time it's really quite pure, poor. Um, but for these compounds, um, it's much more reliable. And we think that's probably related to the better solubility of the compound. We also find that the um, apparent potency is better. That might also be related to the better um, solubility of the compound. So we've um, managed to find um, a, a somewhat better agonist here. Uh, which we call Yoda 2, new and improved, slightly better lightsaber, um, but I'm sure there's a long way to go, but shows that it's, that it's possible. So we've been doing more calcium assays and we've been trying to make it more suitable, but I'm sort of, this is really a preliminary um, to me telling you that to use nanines equipment will be much better, but this is um, just telling you that the flex station can do, can do good things. So one thing we found is with a longer exposure to the agonist, you get a shift to the left, which can be good with channels such as the human piezo one, which is less sensitive. And we also use a hypotonic stimulus um, to try to mimic mechanical force sensing. It's not very good. But it is a feature of lymphedema, actually. You get hypotonicity. And it does stimulate the calcium signal in a Yoda-1 dependent manner in the flex station. And then we've been looking at the effects of various compounds and just a few examples here. And this is the most active one here. It gives a slightly better enhancement of the hypoosmolarity response in Yoda-1 here. It's quite similar to the compound I showed you earlier on um, with the benzoic acid in the fourth, fourth position here, um, but with a lack of a nitrogen here in the middle in the middle group. And so this one is slightly improved. I'm just showing you that because um, what we can then show is, um, this is the data I showed you before, just to repeat that, for, this is for Yoda-1. So this is the wild type and that's the mutants to the right. Um, but now, um, with this compound here, um, this is the one, the structure shown over here. So it's got this four benzoic acid group here. Um, at three micromolar and 0.3 micromolar, it's better than Yoda-1. This is Yoda-1. It's on the mutant channel um, here, and this is all the other mutant channel. So this is the new compound enhancing more than Yoda-1, suggesting that it's possible to improve the rescue of the mutants um, with new and improved Yoda one analog. So then the dose response curves. Now, now we can get full dose response curves um, for three of the four mutants. One of them's a little bit dodgy here, um, but they're shifted to the left compared with over here. So we've made an improvement. We're not where we want to be yet, but I think it shows that it may be possible to do this. And then onto the really exciting stuff now. So onto the um, um, what we've been doing with Nanayan. And uh, <clears throat> I have to say, apart from my um, student, um, Jacob Kinsella, visiting Nan I and having a great time here for a few weeks. Um, um, this work didn't happen in Leeds. This had this all happened here. So my student Jacob came here, but fantastic members of the team here and uh, did brilliant work on this. And we've just started to publish some papers um, together on this. Um, so here on my parsonage at and then this very recent one here by Nicoletta. So Nicoletta, maybe someone, I don't know. She's not here, is she? She's not here, is she? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you will have seen this um, get down, downstairs. So you may be familiar with the idea that the uh, cell sits on this um, fancy little hole at the bottom here, and then there's normally pipetting of, of a drug onto here to study its effects. But um, the team here uh, have used this to very good effect to apply fluid flow to the cell, uh, which probably acts partly through a shear stress response and also through compression of the cell. 
And the team here have done a fantastic amount of work to show that this can activate the piezo channel. So you may be familiar with some of the limitations of the calcium measurement. For one thing, of course, we're struggling to get a mechanical stimulus. Some people have now produced fluid dynamic systems for calcium measurements, so that is that is possible. Um, but of course, it's not electrophysiology by calcium measurement, so that, that's a weakness in itself. And here, now we can have voltage clamp. So really quite powerful. So um, these are cells from our lab. This is an inducible hex cell. That, that's where we get induction of human piezo one expression in the hex cells. And then this is a constitutive expression of the mouse piezo one um, or neither of them. And so in the neither condition, um, sometimes a little bit of something, but nothing very impressive. Um, and then for the mechanical stimulus alone, then there's some current notes that are relatively small here. This is just an early phase of the studies and you'll see an improvement on that. Um, but this is caused by an ejection of fluid from here at a pretty high speed, so 110 microliters per second, a 20 microliter injection. So it's a transient fluid flow effect. So it's not quite like in the patch where you can apply a sustained pressure pulse and then you see the channel activity inactivate. Here, this is a transient mechanical stimulus, but nevertheless, it's a mechanical stimulus. And then if you do that with, with Yoda 1, then the things look quite similar, uh, but notice the scale is different here. So 200 <laughs> compared to 20, so now the responses are bigger. So these are sensitive um, to the piezo 1 agonists, which is good because we think they should be. <clears throat> these are some uh, data we published um, earlier in the year, just at the end of 2022, actually. And um, looking at these different compounds, so this KC157, um, this is the one where the benzoic acid hydroxyl group is in the second position and it's inactive at the channels in the calcium assay. And the number of responding cells, well, a few, probably just artifacts here. Uh, Yoda 1 um, improved, but problematic. It's doing something, I'll just show you, it can work. Um, but with the KC159, um, which is the four benzo acid, benzoic acid compound. The potassium salt we call Yoda 2. So this is a new improved Yoda agonist. Now um, much better percentage of responders. Trying to construct, construct a dose response curve to Yoda 1 was problematic. And I've mentioned that to you before, and that could be related quite a bit to the solubility or poor solubility of the compound. Um, notice the signals now are better here for KC159, the new and improved um, agonist, and we actually get quite a nice dose response curve. So it is possible to study agonists. And then this is some of the most uh, recent um, work here from uh, Nicoletta, Gustina, Marcus. Uh, all this began with uh, discussions with Andrea, and of course, medine has been closely involved in all of this. So a really great team effort from Nana. And then looking at whether there's advantage to having more than one hole in the chip, so in this case, four holes um, in the chip. And then this is where the pipette comes down over the top. And showing that the um, percentage of responders, this is for the mouse uh, mouse channel, and this is mechanical stimulus alone, um, is is much better now with the with the four hole chip. Um, they also studied the eight hole chip, um, not much improvement. So the four seems to be ideal, makes quite a a step change in performance. And then um, just just lastly, to show another advantage of this technique, you won't be able to read all of this, but we've been through a pretty horrendous process using a fluorescence assay to screen a library of around about 11,000, that's the exact number here, 11,200 compounds. And so if we've, um, at Leeds, created our own library of compounds from commercial sources. Some of these compounds were made by us as well, are unique to us. And then uh, we've tested them to look um, for inhibition of the Yoda, Yoda response. And our hit rate was around about 1%. 1%. And we found these, and then we started going through a laborious process of cross-checking them on the flex station and also by manual patch clamp. But manual patch clamp, those who've done it with piezo, it's quite tricky to do because the channels are quite labile. So, you know, you stimulate them and then you try and stimulate them again a few minutes later and the current's really small, sort of faded away and you can't get it to come again. Other times the current's there and you don't know why it's quite sort of erratic. So you have to have quite big caps between the pulses. You have to be careful about the length of time you stimulate them. Also how you form the seal, of course, it's a mechanical effect as you're forming the seal. This can desensitize the channels. It's not so easy to get nice data. Um, we have um, got good data, but it's tricky. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that um, Jacob Kinsella did, Jacob's my PhD student, he's just um, writing up. He um, is a chemist, and we got really interested in biology assays, so he does manual patch lamp. 
um, also did these, working closely with Tom, I think he's in the audience, I've seen Tom somewhere, or maybe he's outside, just there, and um, working very closely here at, um, at Nanine. Um, and he also does calcium assays, and he's just writing up now, so he'll be looking for a job. So if you're looking for somebody like that, then he may be interested. And uh, basically, this is the fluid flow activation of the human piezo, piezo one. Um, not actually showing the stimulus point here, but then they 110 microliters per second is applied, and you can see activation of the channels. It then decays, partly probably because the channels inactivate, but also because the fluid flow is stopping because it's a transient stimulus, as I mentioned. And then you can do that in the presence of of an inhibitor compound. So um, we sent these compounds over blinded. So we had some that we were knew, knew were inactive and some we knew were active. It's all blinded and then studied here. And it's turned out really well. We've got really great results. So the ones that we were thinking might be active indeed are active. And uh, we've actually got dose response data thanks to a huge effort from um, Jacob and Tom and the team here. Uh, this is our best one so far. This is the best point. Why not show the best data against the last slide I'm showing? Um, so um, 276 nanomolar IC50 for this one against human piezo one, but it is the best, as I say. The others sit around about one micromolar. But for those who are familiar with the piezo one field, and uh, the antagonists of piezo one are pretty poor at the moment. We've got gadolinium, we've got ruthenium red. Those are very very non-specific. And there's uh, GSMTX4 gramostola toxin four. It works about 2.5 micromolar, but it seems to bind to the lipid bilayer inhibits a variety of mechanical sensitive processes. It does work against the piezo channels, but yeah, in inhibitors, we don't really have them. They could be really, really useful as tool compounds. And there seems to be some disease situations where the piezo channel is vastly upregulated and it might be useful to inhibit it. Who knows? Right now, these are tool compounds. So if I can finish up by saying that um, um, piezo one, as you probably know already, is what we refer to as a professional native force center. Professional meaning we think that's what nature designed it for. It's a shear stress sensor of the endothelium. Probably the first thing that happens when shear stress is applied to the endothelium with activation of piezo one. And there are natural, mechanically insensitive variants of piezo one associated with lymphedema. There are pericardial effusions and microvascular disruptions in these in these people. Um, Chemical agonists improve various uh, variant functions, so it may be a way forward to help these patients. It's a very rare condition, so the commercial aspect of this is not that clear. But um, lymphedema itself, most commonly, is secondary to something else, some kind of injury or surgery. It's extremely common worldwide, at least 250 million people with it. No treatment except for using socks and things like that to keep uh, the, the swelling down and things like that, so having a treatment could be good. And some people have shown that Yoda 1 is effective in vivo and safe to use in mice, so maybe it's true with other agonists. We have tried with our um, better compound, Yoda 2 as well, and it seems to be safe in the mice. So we think there may be um, a new era of new Star Wars pharmacology coming, Yoda et al. We'll see, could be exciting. And um, we're also very excited that now um, it's possible to have automated mechano activation or mechanical agonist antagonist inhibitor studies of piezo-1 and maybe other mechanically sensitive channels, who knows, but certainly piezo-1. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for that really, really wonderful talk. I hope Lucasfilm is aware of this uh, honor of uh, <laughs> new, <laughs> potentially very important compounds being named for these characters. Fantastic work. I'd like to open up for questions. One already at the back. Do the EM structures suggest why the point mutations inhibit the channel? Um, no, because they haven't been studied by cryo EM. Um, we do know that um, two of the mutations are in the cap structure, and you may have seen Bei Long Xiao's recent um, bioarchive preprint release suggests um, the, supporting the idea that the cap structure is indeed a cap, and it may move down further onto the blades. So these residues are close to where the cap structure touches onto the blade. So they're like feet that come down off, off the cap. So it's hand waving, of course, but somehow it, it must distort that structure. Yeah, but there are no cryo and structural data for it. We are doing modeling. Uh, very, very exciting work. Um, following up on that question, a lot of uh, channel neuropathies are caused not so much by change of function, but loss of trafficking. Uh, CFDR, core channel, calcium ion channel, uh, yeah. heart. Do you have any information 
how or if these point mutation affect uh, trafficking to the, to the membrane. And one of those four mutations does affect um, surface trafficking and the total amount of protein. Uh, the other three don't or have very minor effects. There is one reported by Victor Lukacs back in 2015 from Modern Pathophysics Group suggesting a loss of trafficking, but the expression is still normal. So I think there's a whole variety. Yes. I mean, the total expression may be normal, but they may be stuck in the in the ER yes. in these text cells. And so uh, yeah. along that line, a lot of uh, agents that uh, drugs that bind to the channel actually also restore the trafficking rescue, which you probably didn't look at because these are very acute experiments. So how long did you incubate with your drugs in this experiment? These are normally up to 20 minutes, but in a calcium assay, so we're not looking at the trafficking in that. But they, yeah, they might help. They uh, could, the, these trafficking effects can be rather quickly. I mean, yes. the membrane turns off. We, so we, we study a lot of uh, drugs uh, or trafficking um potassium channels and yeah. it's amazing how many how many drugs actually affect and improve that bind and block the channel and bring the channel to the membrane and that can be rather rapid so it's something for you to yeah it's to an consider. interesting question we've wondered about this so maybe we can chat more later about doing that yeah there are a lot of tagged channels now so we can begin to do that even including for native gazo as well be done. brilliant thank you david just in the interest of time i'll close the yeah. questions for now and if anyone else has any more questions please feel free to, to come up to david for the post decisions and drinks. Thank you again, David. Pleasure.